questions? Questions about networks? People seem to like networks. It's getting sunny, and you guys are getting very distracted. I can sense it on the campus. <laughs> yes, Leah. Could you briefly run through again how the friendship paradox is Okay. So the friendship paradox is, uh, is a mathematical fact. Maybe I can explain it by analogy. Okay. So, so you guys, uh, it's very related to the class size paradox. Actually, it's the same thing mathematically. So if you survey Yale students and you say to Yale students, how big are the classes you're in? You're going to say, Yale, is, they sold me a false bill of goods. They told me I was going to get small classes where the professors are paying a lot of attention to me. And instead, I get all these lectures and it's driving me insane. Right? So most of you, raise your hands if you think, I've got too many lectures. You're, just, you're doing all these big lecture classes, right? And you have very, very few small classes that you really get the kind of attention from faculty that we ostensibly provide. That's your perspective, right? If you go talk to the dean of the college and you say to him or her, him now, uh, what, is, uh, you know, what is the average class size of the classes at Yale? He said, they're tiny. If you look at all the classes we offer, uh, you know, the average class has only you know, 20 students in it or whatever the number is. Now, how can those both be true? How can it be true that from the perspective of the students, you have huge classes, which you do, but from the perspective of the, uh, the policymaker, you have small classes? Anyone beginning to form an intuition about this? Yeah. Matt. There are more people in big classes. Exactly. There are more people in big classes. So each one of you, so for every one of class like this, there are a couple hundred of you here. 200 of you report that you have one class of 200 students, but only 20 of you report that you have a class of 20 students. So from the point of view of the, the dean looking at the things, the average class size seems very small, but the experience of students is totally different. Friendship paradox is kind of like that. People with many friends have many friends. So many of those people nominate them the popular individuals. So it's the same kind of, did that help that analogy? Yes. Yeah. Other people want to understand friendship? It's a very cool thing. Incidentally, the friendship paradox is a direct mathematical consequence of variation in degree. Right, so if, remember we, uh, I, I don't know if I showed you any degree distribution. I can't remember, but uh, so the degree distribution, so this is the, uh, this is the degree. How many people have one, two, three, four, uh, 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 one or more friends, two or more friends, three or more friends, and so forth. This is the percent, and you might, or, or the number, let's say. And the degree distributions typically look like this. So many people have one friend, fewer people have two friends, very few people have a thousand friends or whatever. It has this kind of distribution. If, uh, if everyone uh, had the same number of friends, so, so the, the, um, the, the fact that there's variation in the number of friends that people have, and the more variation there is, the longer this, this the more spread out this is, the more the friendship paradox works. And you can get that intuition by imagining that everyone had the same number of friends. No variation. No variation in degree. Whatever that number of friends is. You all have two friends, you all have three, you all have four. In that scenario, your friends have the same number of friends that you do. Everyone has the same number of friends. There's no variation in degree, so the friendship paradox doesn't work. The friendship paradox works or arises as a consequence of the fact that people vary in how many friends they have, and the popular people have more friends than the unpopular people and are nominated more often by those people, and there you have more couplets where your friend has more friends than you do. Something like that. It's really a cool thing. And it was, it was published by a sociologist in the American Journal of Sociology like 30 years ago, and basically lay unused and undiscovered until we and a bunch of other people said, hey, actually, this is a pretty cool thing. You can do some cool things with this. And so we applied the finding in all the ways that we discussed it. Other questions? OK, so the past three lectures, we've, uh, we've explored the rules governing how humans assemble themselves into social networks. And we've learned a bit about what living in networks means for our lives and how it affects our behaviors, our emotions, our attitudes, and even our infections. And last time, we saw a bit about how knowledge about network structure and function might actually be exploited to intervene in the world, both offline and online, to try to improve different sorts uh, of outcomes. Still, the question sort of remains, what's the point of a connected life? How does it help us as an individual, as individuals, 
and as a species. And it turns out that networks are a resource that we can all use. Networks are a kind of social capital. And that is one of the most interesting ideas you're going to learn in this course, this idea of social capital. And the paper by Coleman, which was assigned for the reading today, is a really, really deep and interesting paper, which I'd strongly encourage you to give serious attention to. <coughs> now, most people, when they think about capital, think about money. But actually, capital is any stock of resources that can be put to productive use. So what is capital? Capital is a stock of resources that you can do something with. You can be productive. That's what capital is. And two further key ideas about capital are that in order to create capital, you have to invest skill and effort. You have to know something and do something in order to create capital first. And second, and much more subtle and very, very interesting, that in order to create capital, you have to make changes in a substance that make it yield a higher rate of return than it otherwise would. You have to work upon the material world. You have to transmute the natural world. And that at a very deep and fundamental level, what capital creation is all about is this working upon the world to transform it in a way that makes it more productive and makes it valuable. So, for example, a farm is a stock of capital. By investing labor and skill to clear the woods, you create a farm. And a farm is more valuable than a forest because you can do things with a farm you couldn't do with a forest, namely grow fruits and vegetables and grains and flowers, for example. So unless you're interested in lumber, a farm is a more valuable resource than a forest. Okay? You invest skill and effort, you clear the land, you transform the land, you transform the natural world, and that's what makes a farm a reservoir of wealth and a source of productive power. Or, for example, you could take a tree and you could invest skill and effort and mill the tree into lumber. And the lumber is more valuable than the tree because you can do things with the lumber you couldn't do with a tree. Namely, invest still more skill and effort and convert the lumber to a violin. And a violin is more valuable than the lumber because you can do things with a violin that you couldn't do with a lumber. Namely, make music. So at each step of the way, you, you invest skill and effort and you transform the natural world and you make it into something that you think that's valuable, that's a stock of resources that can be put to productive use. And that's what the capital creation process at its most fundamental level is all about. So capital is a change that allows the substance to act in new ways. And this is part of what makes it a store of wealth and a source of productive power. Or consider this example. You could take a lump of iron, you could manipulate the iron in various sorts of ways and make it into a hammer. A hammer is more valuable than the lump of iron. Or you could manipulate the hammer still more or use it in some way and make a jet engine. And a jet engine is, of course, still more valuable than the hammer because you can do things with a jet engine you couldn't do with a hammer. At every step, transforming it in some particular way. Now, a key innovation in the social sciences, in thinking in the social sciences, took place in the 1960s where we began to see people and their skills and talents as a form of human capital. And the chief example of this is education. If you endow someone with skills and knowledge, we have changed them and they become more productive. And we have changed them in a way similar to other types of capital we've been discussing. And they can earn a return on our investment yielding income, just like the other uh, examples. So take this uh, former graduate student of mine who was a drunkard, this dissolute uh, kid, and we can invest skill and effort and clean him up. We send him so he's no longer a drunkard, and here he is now. We have changed his mind. We have done things upon him that have made him now more productive and capable of doing things he wasn't previously able to do. And then we can invest still more skill and effort and give him an education. Who knows where he graduated from college? Columbia. Columbia. Good, very good. Uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's right, he went to Columbia. So you can invest still more skill and effort and give him an education. So what have we done? We have changed the neurons of his brain. We have worked upon the material world, changed him in a way that endows him with capacity to be productive uh, in a way that previously was not possible. And in fact, many have argued, and in fact, there are other things that we might do with our bodies other than educate ourselves to make us productive. So what might be some of those examples? Other than give you an education, what else could you do with your body to make you more productive? I forgot your name. Joel. Joel. Exercise. 
exercise. Yeah, you can work on your physical body, right? You can become more fit. You can invest skill and effort, get a fitter body, and you can do things with a fitter body that you couldn't do with a less fit body. That's exactly right. Um, and we can do still other kinds of things, and that also might make us live longer. That's a return on investment. That's a productive uh, outcome of, of, uh, of, of, of the fitness uh, investment. In, fa in fact, many people have argued that health itself is a stock of human capital, just like education or intelligence or other kinds uh, of features. Okay, what about this kind of change? Is this, a, is this an investment in human capital? Is this productive? Raise your hands. Uh, Joel again, right? Um, well, I, there are like, many ways that you can reach this, but yes. in some places it might seem more attractive to have that tattoo so that you would have a relationship with them. Okay, speak up. That's a really good idea you just articulated, so let's hear it again. Um, so, so in some places, this might be what? Very attractive. Um, and as a result? You might um, help grow the population because of uh, having that tattoo. So basically Wait, so, you, so your argument is that this tattoo might be effective at getting mates. Yeah. And if you get mates, it might make you more sexually attractive. It might be more productive of children, right? Is that your argument? Yeah, yeah that's a good argument. So this tattoo in this situation, as are described by Joel, could be uh, a capital investment because it makes you more productive and capable of doing things you weren't previously able to do. That's one scenario. What's an alternative idea about this tattoo? Under what scenario is it not a capital improvement? Is it not capital producing? Yes. What's your name? Jackie. Kathy, yeah. Jackie. Jackie, yeah, Jackie. Uh, so limits are more opportunity. Say that again? So limits are more opportunity so Oh yeah, so if you have that right, very good. So if you acquire this or if people with facial tattoos can't get employment. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of issues, that's right. But I'm thinking of something a little bit related to that, but a little bit different, other ideas? What was crucial in Joel's argument about this being a capital investment? What? It would make you more attractive. Yeah, that it makes you more attractive, that it's and that's sort of related to what Jack was saying. No, if you got this as a consumption good, right, if this was merely decorative, if it wasn't productive of anything, right, if you just got the tattoo and you, it was just a decorative item, it didn't actually make you capable of doing things you weren't previously able to do, then it's not a capital investment, okay? So you, invest, you get this tattoo, it makes you be able to attract more mates or something, that is a productivity uh, enhancement. So it's the difference between a consumption good and a capital improvement, and the tattoo can be seen in different sorts of perspectives. What about this tattoo? Who knows what this is? Raise your hands if you know what this is. Anyone? Yeah, in the back there? <coughs> yeah, it's a Maori tattoo. What's your name? Teddy. Teddy. It's a Maori tattoo. And why do the Maori, in addition to showing their family history, there's another reason the Maori do this. What is it? Yeah, Gianna? Um, isn't it like marks your transition into adulthood? Yeah, it marks your transition into adulthood, but there's a more specific reason. What's the value to a Maori warrior? You scare your enemies, right? This makes you more fearsome. It's a frightening to your opponents to have this kind of tattoo. So this makes you more productive and capable of doing things you weren't previously able to do. Scare your opponents, okay? So this would be a human capital kind of change, just like education, just like getting fit, these tattoos on your body. But what about plastic surgery for modifying one's body? Who are these people? Who, who's the guy on the left? Okay, and the woman on the right? Okay, so uh, of course, Tom, this is how Tom looked when he was a young man before he had a ton of plastic surgery, and this is Tom, who looked quite fine even before the surgery, not his wife anymore. Uh, what is the, uh, why do these people get, uh, modify their bodies? And we discussed plastic surgery, remember when we did social construction. What's, what's in it for them? This is not a hard question, it's not a sneaky question. Yeah, what's your name? Birdie. A birdie, yeah, hi Birdie. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So in their line of work, modifying your body to be more attractive could be extremely valuable. Now, if they were like, you know, physicists working in a lab, uh, this might not have any effect on their ability to be productive, right? Just getting a plastic surgery of this kind, getting a different nose, for example, isn't material if your trade is being a physicist. But it's very material if your trade is being uh, an actor. Now, just like physical capital is created by a change in the material world, and human capital by a change in persons, 
Social capital is a change in the relations among persons, a change, excuse me, a change that renders the group more productive and capable of doing things it was not previously able to do. That's what social capital is. Social capital can thus arise in at least two senses from social structure. First, what's flowing within the group or through the connections. So you could be in a group where people are very altruistic to each other, very cooperative, share information, or in a group where germs are flowing a lot through your group, okay? Those structural features that flow through the graph that you're occupying is an attribute of social capital because it affects the ability of the group to be productive, to do things it wasn't previously able uh, to do. And the second aspect of social capital, in addition to contagion, remember in the last lecture we talked about connection effects and contagion effects, both of those ideas apply to social capital. We, you can think about what's happening. Are you a part of a trusting group? Being part of a trusting group is a really powerful and effective thing. Okay, raise your hands if in your high school you could leave your backpacks and nobody would steal them. Okay, raise your hands if that was an insane thing to do in your high school. Right, so some of you, half of you went to high schools where you could do that and half where you couldn't do that. Now those of you that were in high schools where you couldn't leave your backpack, think about all the effort and headache you had to assume. You had to carry it with you, you had to think about it, worry about it, maybe it was stolen and it caused you a hardship or a loss. Being in a high school where you don't have to worry about that makes your life easier. You're now able to do things you weren't previously able to do because you're part of a social network, part of a group that has higher social capital in this regard like the norm of not stealing other people's backpacks. Do you understand the example? Okay, so, or if you're in the example that Coleman gives of the Jewish traders, they could transact business more efficiently because they honored their contracts better, the medieval traders, right? So if you're part of a group where you honor your contracts and you don't have to reduce everything to writing, like the Jewish diamond traders in medieval Europe, actually you're able to outcompete the other groups that don't have as much trust and enforcement of agreements. Do you understand? that makes the group better able to sell diamonds in medieval Italy, okay? Which is what they're trying to do in that situation. The second aspect, in addition to the contagion and what's flowing through it, is the actual structure of the group, how it's organized. And I think, did I give the example of the islands with venereal disease in this class? Did I give that example? No, that doesn't, I didn't give the example. Of syphilis and HIV and the islands in the Pacific and the sailors. All right, well, I'm going to give you that example. Uh, okay, so, uh, so imagine, uh, imagine that you have two islands on the in the Pacific, and, uh, and, uh, and, and there are 100 people on this island and 100 people on this island, and on this island, everyone is having sex with everyone else. Have you told you this example? You would remember it now if I had, okay. So everyone's having sex with everyone else. It's a complete orgy on this island. And uh, it's 100 times 99 divided by 2. It's like 4,500 ties. It's a fully saturated graph on this island. And on this island, nobody is having sex with anyone else. They're all monks and nuns. They just you know, stick to themselves, OK? But on neither island is there an outbreak of a venereal disease. There's no sexually transmitted disease on either island. They're fine. But then a sailor washes up on shore. He has a venereal disease. And he has sex with one person. Where do you get the bigger epidemic? The orgy island, right? So something about the structure of the network. Now, first of all, remember we talked about two lectures ago that networks must be seeded. Networks magnify whatever they're seeded with. This is an example of that idea. Prior to them being seeded, nothing was happening. There's no epidemic of venereal disease on either island. It doesn't matter they're having an orgy. Who cares? No epidemic. But once it's seeded, the network magnifies whatever it's seeded with. Okay? So the structure of the graph in this tiny example uh, matters for whether or not you are at risk for venereal disease. Right? Whether you get a venereal disease depends on the structure of the network around you. The network is a form of social capital. The structure of the network is a form of social capital. And it's similar also to the example we discussed last time of the complex and simple contagion example, where the structure of the graph that you read in, in the science paper by Santola uh, can affect the properties that the group uh, evinces. Going back to the venereal disease example, okay, now imagine that um, that uh, here you have an island and everyone is having sex with everyone else. Now on another island, everyone is having sex with everyone else. But on this island, everyone is immunocompetent. And on this island, everyone is immunocompromised, which means their immune systems don't work. Sailor washes up on shore, has sex with one person. Where do you get a bigger epidemic? Immunocompromised, right? So it's not just something about the network structure that matters. The human capital matters. The attributes of the individual, him or herself, whether their immune systems work or not. You with me still? 
Both are important. So it depends on, you know, are you a Love Actually fan or a Pulp Fiction fan? Now I'm going to tell you a piece of biology you probably didn't know. If you have sex with someone who's HIV positive, per sexual act, depending on your gender and which act and a bunch of other stuff, roughly speaking, even if they're HIV positive, you only have about a 1 in 400, 1 in 500 chance of getting HIV. So having, having sex with someone who's HIV positive doesn't mean you're for sure going to get it. Depends on if you're a man or a woman and the sex act and blah, 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 but roughly speaking, okay? If you have, however, sex with someone who has active syphilis, you have about a 1 in 3 chance of getting syphilis. Okay? Now, everyone is having sex with everyone else. Everyone's having sex with everyone else. Both islands are full of immunocompetent people. Sailor washes up on the shore. In this island, he has HIV. In this island, he has syphilis. Where do you get the bigger epidemic? Syphilis. So it's not just the structure of the network that matters. It's not just attributes of the individuals that matters. It's attributes of the thing itself, the thing that's spreading, that's also highly relevant to the nature of epidemics. Anyway, so social capital can arise in at least two ways. What's flowing through the graph and the structure of the graph are both important. And social capital, in fact, has the following attributes, which are kind of important to understand. So first of all, it inheres in an aspect of social structure. It's kind of like income inequality that we discussed. Social capital, unlike Bourdieu's definition, which probably don't, you guys don't know, but different than this other thinker's definition, uh, is not an attribute of individuals. So if you hear people saying, so-and-so knows a lot about opera, they have tons of social capital, or so-and-so is really an extrovert, they have tons of social capital. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about properties of groups that are social capital, and they adhere in aspects of social structure. It's created by a change in the relations among people. You've worked upon the material world. It facilitates actions by actors. Now, these could be good or bad actions, but it enables uh, individuals to act. It's productive. Productive doesn't mean necessarily just does good things. It could do bad things, but it does something. It's not completely fungible. You can't just transform it into anything. It's scarce, like all forms of capital. That is to say, there's not limitless supply. It's a public good, and I'll come back to what that means. A public good means it's a shared resource that's not consumable. Uh, and it's not, as I've already mentioned, solely positive. Social capital is not lodged in individual actors themselves, which means, as I said, that it's a property of groups, and it must be measured at a group level. It is strictly social. It's not fungible in the sense that it may be specific to certain activities. So social capital might be useful when it comes to uh, reducing uh, infection, but not useful when it comes to some other uh, function. Uh, and, um, and Putnam, from Bowling Alone, a political scientist you may have heard about some of his ideas, Putnam also talks about social capital. So the big theorists are Coleman, Bourdieu, and Putnam. <coughs> Coleman's definition in the reading for today is different than Putnam because Putnam privileges the role of institutional actors. Putnam is very concerned with how governments, and schools, and informal organizations foster the creation of social capital. Whereas Coleman's is a more organic definition, that social capital just emerges from the connections and the relations among people uh, themselves. So, um, okay, and social capital finally is not the same as social cohesion or collective efficacy. <clears throat> Those might be measures of social capital, but that's not what social capital is. Now, as we saw a few lectures ago, different structures have different properties. And connections can matter to the group and to the constituent individuals. So how you organize a group of 100 people can give to that group properties not present uh, in the individuals themselves and properties that the group itself might be affected by. And the idea of social capital is a pro that the, the idea that social capital is a property of a collection of individual entities that emerges, a property that did not exist before the connections were made and that could not have been foreseen by examination of the entities themselves is an illustration of this other big idea we've been discussing throughout the course of emergence, okay? So the idea is there's something special that arises from a group of individuals where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts that, moreover, you could not have foreseen just by studying the individuals. So think about this example that you all learned in high school chemistry, I'm certain you all learned this, uh, which are, these are two allotropes of carbon, right? These are both forms of carbon. And on the left, you have graphite, which is soft and dark. And on the right, you have diamond, which is hard and clear. And there, who knows how many more allotropes of carbon there are? Anyone know? Some of you must know. There are a few more. 
there's amorphic, amorphous carbon, and there's a kind of carbon when meteorites hit the Earth that reforms in some ways. There are nanotubes, carbon nanotubes, or all kinds of other allotropes of carbon. Anyway, these are two allotropes of carbon. And uh, there are two key intellectual ideas here. First of all, the ideas are that these properties of softness and darkness and hardness and clearness of graphite and diamond are not properties of the individual carbon atoms. They are properties of the collection of carbon atoms. That's the first idea. The second idea is which properties you get depends on how you connect the carbon atoms to each other. Connect them one way, you get one set of properties. Connect them another way, you get a different set of properties. And it's the same with human social groups. You take the same people and you connect them one way and they have one set of properties. Connect them another way and they have a different set of properties. It's the ties between people that make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. New properties emerge because of the connections, because of the ties between people, and not necessarily or solely because of the people themselves. And in fact, our experience of the world depends on the actual structure of the ties around us, near and far. So the idea is that social capital is a property of a collection of individual entities that emerges a property that did not exist before the connections were made and that could not have necessarily been foreseen by examination of just those individual components. So for example, another example of emergence is this, is life. You take these simple chemical elements, phosphorus and oxygen and nitrogen and sulfur and carbon and hydrogen and so forth, and you combine them and you get the living thing on the right. So you could study those elements probably till you were blue in the face and never be able to foresee that in the right combination, they give rise to this other phenomenon. Another example is consciousness. Consciousness is an emergent property of neuronal tissue. You could study neurons till you were blue in the face, but not necessarily be able to foresee consciousness, or memory, or other things that arise because of how the neurons are connected uh, to each other. My very favorite example of this, which is drawn from biology, is this one. So this is one of the simplest organisms on the planet. It's a slime mold. It's a unicellular organism called Physarum. And Physarum does very little. Physarum lives on the forest floor and it digests cellulose. So actually what Physarum does is these unicellular organisms fuse with other nearby Physarum cells and they form these long networks of tubes. So if you raised in New England, raise your hands if you've ever lifted wet leaves in the fall and seen those little white little filaments under the leaves. Yeah, okay, well those are physarum, or a species like physarum, which, uh, which form these little tubes, and what they do is they look for dead wood on the forest floor, and they find the wood and bring the nutrients towards the center, and they distribute the waste towards the periphery in these networks of, of tendrils that the physarum uh, does. They make what is known as a superorganism, as discussed and connected. And this superorganism has unexpected properties. For example, if I asked you if this physarum was smart, if this was an intelligent organism, for example, if it could maybe solve a maze or something, you would say, what are you talking about? And yet, it turns out that they can solve mazes. So this is an example by a Japanese mycologist, uh, Toshi Nakagaki. And what Toshi did is he took the physarum and he plated it on a little plate. And at the entrance and at the exit to the maze, he put some oat flakes, some simple cellulose uh, products, two sources of food. And then he let the physarum do what it's trying to do, and here's what it did. The physarum is, uh, is bubbling up, they're fusing all the physarum cells, it's going to fill the whole mold, the whole, uh, there's the entrance and exit to the maze of the oat flakes, the physarum is filling everything in the whole uh, plate, and in a moment, all the paths are going to die back except the one most efficient path through the maze. Actually, this physarum is better able to solve mazes than Toshi's graduate students. <laughs> Not better than my graduate students. <laughs> uh, and uh, and it's, it's an organism which is designed for a purpose of finding efficient paths. And you can actually then use it. This, this maze-solving property of the physarum is an emergent property of this unicellular organism when you connect it uh, to each other. It, it can evince a kind of primitive intelligence. Now, it turns out that another friend of mine, Mark Fricker, who is uh, a, a, a British mycologist at Pembroke College in Oxford, Mark Fricker had the idea of exploiting this in the following way. He took a map of England and he put oat flakes in every city. He let the physarum 
develop a network among the oat flakes. Here on the right is what the Faisarum did, and on the left is the British railway network made by British railway engineers over 200 years. And it turns out that when this network was shown to the railway engineers, they said, oh my god, this is brilliant. Why did we think to put these lines here and there that provide load balancing features, and if one city's railway network goes down, you can route the traffic around? Why did we think of that? That actually the Faisarum was better able to engineer a system of railway tracks in England than humans trying to figure out how to do it. And in fact, this resulted in Mark being appointed by the Queen to Her Majesty's Commission on the Rails. So this Japanese mycologist, or this uh, British mycologist who studies fungi, is now working with railway engineers to figure out how to uh, create these kinds of networks. Now here's a related example. Some of you may have seen this video. Raise your hands if you've seen the starlings of Otmore. Some of you have, okay. Uh, and this is, this is an example also from Otmore, England. So this is, just watch this. These are some birds. So it's pretty impressive behavior that these birds have been. People have been wondering about this since the time of Aristotle. So how does this behavior occur? How does this happen? Any ideas? Is there, is there a leader bird that's organizing it all and saying, OK, fly to the left, now fly to the right? Is there some kind of organizing bird? No, there's no head starling uh, giving orders. So I'm going to actually do an experiment with you guys right now. So listen to my instructions. Everyone ready? OK, so I want you right now to all try very hard to clap in unison. Start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you did that within a second. OK, how did you do that? Did I have like a metronome up here? I was going clap, clap, clap. No, I didn't do that. So how was it achieved? How did you guys do that? Yeah, Bertie. You listen to each other. That's right. Now, can anyone elaborate on that? How did you listen to each other? What were you doing? Do you know when you were clapping? Do you have any in intuition as to what you were doing exactly? Ideas? Yeah? Um, sorry, at the back there, what's your name? You, right there. Victoria, yeah? Okay, so you waited till you, you could hear others. That's right. You were listening to others. I get that. Good point. Yeah, in the back there. Yeah, what's your name? Sam. Sam, uh-huh. Like just by random chance, there's like some moments that are clapping louder and some that's quieter, and when you clap in a quieter moment, it feels wrong, so you want to clap in a much moment. Okay, so that's a, another intuition. We're getting closer to what it is. All of these ideas are, are relevant. Yeah, what's your name? Tiwa. Tiwa? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, well, I was just kind of like, Yes, right, that's exactly right. So you, you, you could be listening, trying to listen to the whole group and sort of picking up on what Sam said, trying to average out. Well, as people are slightly out of phase and uh, I'm gonna try to pick the average phase and then clap in sync with that. Or you listen to the people around you, just, you synchronize your, your clapping just with the people that are within short earshot. And everyone doing that, eventually you become coupled oscillators. You're all yoked together and you can clap in unison. And you can do this by the very simple rule. I can organize you guys to evince this behavior just by this tiny little, uh, tiny little thing. Now there are other possible ideas. One idea that you didn't propose is that there are cultural norms regarding clapping frequency. 
you know, maybe if you were from Spain and we knew that, you know, flamenco was like, you know, a particular, uh, particular rhythm and you all had learned that rhythm, uh, that, you know, then you would all just immediately adopt the specific tempo that was required. Uh, there's the global synchrony idea and the local synchrony idea, which of course is the right idea. And it turns out that this complex group behavior can arise from individuals following, uh, actually doing very simple things or following very simple rules. Take our birds example. Uh, there was a program of artificial agents called Boids, which is a play on a kind of mispronunciation of birds, a kind of ethnic dialect, developed by Craig Reynolds in 1986, which simulates the flocking behavior of birds or the schooling behavior of fish. So imagine a collection of computer agents, artificial agents, that live just in the computer that obey three rules. So one rule is uh, that they remain close to their, their neighbors. So this is the zone of attraction. So this little bird, its job is to say, look, I don't want to get all up on my own. I'm going to have to stay near other fish or other birds, OK? So that's the zone of attraction. And the second rule is move in the same direction as your neighbor. So this is the zone of alignment. So you kind of stay with a herd, you stay with a flock, and in addition, you look around and see where's everyone else swimming or flying. I'm going to go where they're swimming or flying. That's the second rule. And the third rule, which is the zone of repulsion, says avoid collisions with your neighbors. So if you and I are both staying together and going in the same direction, but we're at slightly different incident angles to each other, our vectors are not parallel, we'll bump into each other. We kind of correct so that we're flying you know, in parallel to each other. Just those three rules. And if you create agents that obey just those three rules, you can actually very much emulate real behavior of the starlings of Atmur. So this is now artificial. This is a visualization of these artificial boids. And to these boids, he's also added an artificial predator hawk. So these are little poor little starlings. And they're trying to avoid this predator hawk who's going to be diving towards them. And this is the behavior of these computerized birds. These are not living things. These are little computer birds. So the point is, is that you can emulate this very complex group level behavior as a product of very simple individual rules. And you get this emergent flocking behavior as a result of uh, simple individual level interactions. And I hope you're already beginning to see how this is similar to Adam Smith's argument about the emergence of markets. That each individual, following his own rules, transacting business, buying and selling goods, when we all coll collude together to do that, we create a market which provides information about the proper or efficient price of a good, for example. So markets are emergent properties of individuals, for example. Or Wikipedia has emergent properties of accuracy. Each of us contributing a little knowledge to Wikipedia. You should all be editing Wikipedia, by the way. If you know something about something, you should be contributing to Wikipedia, not just consuming it. So, and you all of us contribute a little bit of information, and then the the totality of that contribution is more accurate than any individual's knowledge alone. Now, why might animals collaborate in the first place? Well, because there's value in this collaboration. It's a kind of social capital. And it has sometimes to do with avoidance of predators in the case of schooling fish. But there are other kinds of theories as well. And, and one, here's one idea, which is that two or many heads are better than one. And this is one of the most this is one of the results in science that I've read in the last 10 years that I just keep thinking about. I just can't get this one out of my head. It's a beautiful paper published by Ian Kuzu's group about 10 years ago now in uh, Nature. <coughs> so, so here's the idea. So you have, you have uh, uh, most, many of you know this, that birds sometimes have to migrate tremendous distances. Like there's some species of albatross that fly from the north to the south pole, like 10,000 miles. They spend weeks in the air. They never land. They just fly for days and nights, nonstop, they fly for weeks, okay? So imagine now you have a species of bird on the coast of the California, and they have, to, they have to fly to their breeding grounds, which is, you know, 5,000 miles away over the open ocean. Everyone with me so far with the hypothetical? Now imagine amongst this flock of birds, 
Everyone has a slightly different opinion about which way to fly. You want to fly, you know, uh, northwest, and he wants to fly north by northwest, and he wants to fly north by north northwest, and she wants to fly north by northeast. You know, so everyone has a slightly different opinion about which way to fly. If you were a smart flock of birds, what should you do? Hello, what should you do? Ideas, Rosario. Ideas? Um, if there's a large group of birds that are flying in a particular way, you go with a larger population. <clears throat> okay, that's it's right. You want to stay with a flock, but now you each have a slightly different opinion about which way to fly. So what should the birds as a group do? What's the most accurate thing for the birds to do? Yeah, Sam. Average. The birds are going to average their uh, direction of flight. And that's good because if you know anything about signal to noise theory, what you know is, is that actually noise is random in a system, but the signal is really there. So each bird contains some signal and noise. If you average all of those, those signals, the signal will be accentuated, which is the true direction they should fly in. And the noise gets averaged out, and that's the smart thing for the birds to do. Is everyone with me so far? Oh, yeah, what's your name? Uh, Ruben. Ruben. So they don't actually decide who to they just have it out. Yeah, yeah so the, what actually, we don't, we don't really know what the birds are doing. We do know the birds have slightly different intentions of which direction to fly, and they kind of follow these simple rules of flying near each other and so forth. They kind of average out their opinions in the flock that moves in the one uniform direction, staying together and so forth. We don't fully understand this, and we certainly don't understand the neurology of it. Okay, but now, here's the thing that blows my mind. Imagine now that you're a flock of birds in California, and half the birds want to fly due west, and half the birds want to fly due south. Should the birds average their opinions now? Yes or no? Raise your hands if you think the birds should still average their opinions. Raise your hands if you think the birds should not average their opinions. Why should the birds not average their opinions? Yes, what's your name again? I forgot. I, I, yeah, I, they, they better off laying the two miles. Yes, it's certain death to average their opinion. Before, averaging is a brilliant strategy that maximizes the chances of survival and getting to the right angle, uh, island. Now, it's a stupid strategy. It's certain death. 100% of the birds will fly with certainty to the wrong direction. There's no island southwest. It's either north, south, or west, but certainly not southwest, okay? So, what do the birds do when they have big differences of opinion? They don't average their opinions anymore, they vote. They pick, they switch from the mean to the mode of the distribution. It's unbelievable. And they do that at a very specific point. So in the range of small opinions, they pick the average, but when they get to a point where there's sufficient differences of opinion, the birds flip to a different strategy of integrating the information. Nobody knows how they do this. It's just totally incredible as far as I'm concerned. And there are many analogies to human social systems that we do not fully understand. Once again, the issue of social capital and emergence take us back to the questions of how we explain social phenomena. Is it a question of methodologic individualism? Do explanations for social phenomena, class, markets, power, institutions, must they be formulated as or reducible to the characteristics or actions of individuals? Or do we need a methodological holism kind of approach? wherein we see each social entity, group, institution, or network as having a totality that is distinct from and not understandable by merely studying the individual component elements. So the argument we've been making for the whole class is that both are necessary, both are valuable, but you cannot ignore the latter, right? There are properties of groups that are not reducible to properties of individuals, and you need to study the whole if you're really going to understand it. Social phenomena, for example, culture, have an enduring reality that transcends individuals. And Durkheim, for example, argued that social facts can and must be studied and explained independent of the individual. And social capital is complicated because certain aspects of social capital are byproducts of individual actions. They have something to do with what individuals are doing, but they don't adhere to the individuals. Just like the carbon atoms, the, the properties of graphite or diamond have something to do with the carbon bonding to its neighbors, but those properties of softness and darkness and hardness and clearness aren't properties of the carbon atoms. They're properties of the collection of carbon atoms. So what are some types of social capital? We've seen, for example, how topologies can contain capital, how different topological architectures of networks can, complain, can contain capital. And we've seen, for example, how groups can differ in the trustworthiness within them which allows concerted action at lower cost, for example, the diamond market example. 
Or information channels are an aspect of social structure that is productive, that actually can reflect the actual structure of the social network itself. So consider, for example, an example we talked about a couple of lectures ago of hospitals with efficient flows of innovative and useful ideas versus hospitals without those flows. Or sports teams that have established means of communicating non-verbally versus those without such established means. Or sports teams with particular architectures compared to sports teams without other architectures. You could have the same human capital, the same ability in the players, but how the team works together can be different from team uh, to team. And norms listed here might include things like attitudes towards justice or altruism or selflessness, for example, that people can count on and are valuable, like the backpack example I gave a moment ago. The last example that Coleman mentions is appropriable organizations, which are extant structures that can be used for a new purpose, such as a club formed for one purpose that serves as another. For example, a choral group that serves as a means for finding a ride. So you're part of an a cappella group, and uh, you join the a cappella group in order to sing, but now all of a sudden that group exists and it can do something else, namely help you figure out how to get to New York City next weekend. A totally different <coughs> productive function of that group. Uh, or a church that can be used for health promotion. So people go to a church in order to you know, practice their religion, but now we can use those social capital to improve the health of the constituent individuals. And all of these are linked to social structures to the, the way human beings are connected uh, to each other. Now, there are a number of provisional ways of measuring social capital. So how might we go about trying to measure? And this turns out to be quite difficult, actually. And there are a number of ideas. There are, none of them are perfect. So what, if you want to measure the social capital of the group, how do you do that? If I want to measure your capital, I can measure your education or the money in your bank account. I've got ways to do it at the individual level. How do I do this? Well, one idea is to measure interpersonal trust. So you go into communities and you say, do people uh, trust each other uh, or not? Another, these are not, I'm talking about something that's not on the slide now. I'll get to what's on the slide in a minute. Another idea is you could might measure income inequality. As a proxy, remember when we introduced income inequality, we talked about how that's a property of groups, not a property of individuals. So maybe groups with more or less inequality have more or less social capital. And some people have argued that high levels of income inequality are associated with lower levels of social capital. Or you might have particular network architectures. You could use some of the science that my lab's engaged in to say, okay, what topological architectures of graphs of social of individuals are optimal for different functions? Can we mathematically specify that and then go and measure this group has a different transitivity level than this group? That must mean something for the group. And it's also worth noting that social capital can be put to bad ends. And this is often misunderstood in the literature of social capital. You can have a gun and you can put that material object, that form of capital, to good use, hunting prey, let's say, or bad use, killing a human being, for example. So social capital is just like other forms of capital. You can do good or bad things with it. For example, and it's also similar to human capital, like bomb making knowledge, for example, can be put to good uh, or bad ends. And note, for example, that bad health habits could be also be enforced by local norms. So you might be in a, in a group that has norms that say you need to smoke, like when you were in high school and some of you started smoking because your friends were smoking. That's an action of social capital being put to productive use, but the thing it's producing, namely smokers, is not something we necessarily would value. So there's some negative effects of social capital, and these include, as listed here, the pressure to conform, the exclusion of outsiders from resources controlled by network members. So often social capital is like it's ours, like our group gets to use it. And so, for example, secret societies and fraternities and sororities one of the reasons they often can be very toxic is because they cultivate this idea is that we have something special and we're going to keep it to ourselves and no one else gets to use it. And so that's, in a way, a downside of social capital. Excessive claims placed on members by free riding. So another possibility is that you, we band together and we make a community that's, let's say, trusting and knowledge sharing and has all these desirable properties. But actually, as a result of that, we uh, expose ourselves to individuals among us who take advantage of us and free ride. And so actually this would be a negative effect of social capital because we now make it possible for someone to be lazy, for instance. And there can be a downward leveling of norms where everyone basically races to the bottom 
to adopt the uh, worst practice is something that can happen when there's a lot of social capital. And also pertinently, differently situated individuals may be differentially able to tap social capital or to access it. So just because there is social capital doesn't mean that everyone can use it uh, at the uh, same time or in the same way. Now one of the properties we mentioned earlier about social capital is that it's a public good. And this is a very, very important idea about social capital. A public good is one in which there is no exclusivity, no non-excludability in consumption. So what we mean by a public good is that there's non-exclusive use, that it often uh, public goods often arise as a byproduct of other actions. There's often underinvestment in public goods, and often public goods are very difficult to create. So what's a public good? Think of a lighthouse is a canonical example. If you build a lighthouse, you invest all that effort to broadcast the light that there is danger here, you can't prevent anyone else from getting the signal. I mean, you benefit. You know not to navigate your boat onto the shore. But all the other boats also benefit. And you can't prevent them uh, from using uh, the boat or using the light. Or think about the air. Your breathing doesn't affect his breathing. You're consuming air. It's a public good, the air. You can't prevent anyone else from uh, using it. Or the national defense. Right? We all benefit from the national defense. It's a public good. My benefiting from the national defense doesn't compromise your ability to benefit from the national defense. And these are all different, for example, than a, than a piece of cake. Right? If I have a piece of cake, it's my cake. You can't have any. And if I eat the cake, there's none left for you. That's totally the opposite of a public good. I can consume it, and I can exclude you from using it. Those are not features of public goods. Public goods have non-excludability and uh, cannot be a, a non, a low con, uh, consumability. Now, because of this, social capital almost always arises as a byproduct of social relationships established for some other reason or from some other activity or purpose. Because social capital is a public good, there's underinvestment in it. We tend not to go out to do it deliberately. So typically, social capital arises because we're doing something else, like joining an a cappella group, uh, and then we create something of value that then we can all use. And because of this, underinvestment or neglect of such resources is a serious problem. And this type of problem, where we neglect the commons, where we neglect resources that are shared, is known as the tragedy of the commons. Is an, and there's another very important idea that is the focus of one of the readings uh, for the class, the Garrett Hardin's famous essay, The Tragedy of the Commons. So why do we underinvest in public goods? Sometimes this underinvestment can arise from a class of phenomena known as social traps. And a classic example of a social trap has to do with Route 28 that used to be a two-lane highway extending the entire length of Cape Cod. Raise your hands if you've ever driven on Route 28. So some of you know what I'm talking about, or you've driven in similar kinds of highways. And it gets absurdly crowded with traffic on the weekends. So here is the highway. It goes all of this way, and everyone is heading to Provincetown on the weekend. And it's literally bumper to bumper uh, in this type of situation. Now here's one man going away for the weekend, but trouble lies ahead for him and for his fellow travelers on uh, Route 28, because as he's driving along Route 28, uh, the mattress poorly secured, flies off his car, and blocks a lane uh, of traffic. So here's the mattress that's shown in yellow over here, and it's blocking the lane of traffic. And now traffic backs up for 10 miles. And my question to you is, why does no one tend the commons? Why does no one move the mattress, which would benefit everyone? So why is that? Why does no one move the mattress? Yeah, Gianna. Because mattress drivers will run them over. Mattress drivers will run them over, yes. People are worried to get out of the car because they're going to be killed. Okay, that's not exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yes, Ike. And you know what the problem is, that we need the mattress here close enough to getting out of the problem that we kind of need the mattress. Exactly. So that's, those are the people in zone uh, three, okay? So let's consider the different zones. Uh, why do people in zone one not move the mattress? They, they, they don't know what the hell's going on. They have no information. They have a very, do they have an incentive to move the mattress? Yes, huge. This guy, what they really should do is pull over and he should run ahead a mile and move the mattress and then run back 
and get back in his car. That would be the really smart. But he doesn't know what the problem is, right? No way of knowing. Uh, what about the guys in zone three, for uh, zone two? Zone two, they may see them actors, but they've been waiting so long, they're like, to hell with this. I'm just almost there. <laughs> zone three guys actually could easily, and, but they might not want to pay the cost, right? But to actually expend the cost at this point. It's not worth it from a cost benefit point. Zone three has the information, it's easy, low cost, I can just pop out, but no longer any incentive at all to move the mattress. And of course, zone four, they're beyond the obstacle, they really don't care what's happening. And as a result, you get a social trap. Nobody moves the mattress, even though it's a very cheap and easy thing to do, it takes you three minutes to get out of your car and move the mattress, and as a result, traffic backs up for miles. Now, I've been teaching this example for like 10 years in this class, and last year I got an email from a former student of mine who said that he was driving along the highway in California and he saw a mattress in this exact situation and he thought of me and he got out of his car and he moved the mattress. <laughs> yes. He just pulled over and moved the flipping mattress and you know, <laughs> saved all of these people the time, paid a small uh, personal price. And there are many, many examples of this. For example, we talked about earlier in the class, free riders and vaccination, right? People who say, well, I'm not going to get vaccinated. I'll let everyone else get vaccinated. Vaccination, herd immunity, herd immunity is a kind of social capital, right? We all benefit from the creation, insulating ourselves from uh, epidemics. And in a famous re example in your essay, there was the famous example of the tragedy of the commons. And Garrett Hardin introduces a hypothetical example of a pasture shared by local herders. And the herders are assumed to wish to maximize their own yield, and so will increase their herd size whenever possible. And the utility of each additional animal has both a positive and a negative component. The positive component is that the herder receives all the benefits of his cattle grazing on the commons, like the New Haven green. The negative component is of, of despoiling the commons is averaged across all the other herders. And so for an individual herder weighing up these utilities, the rational course of action is to add an extra animal, and another, and another, and so forth. But of course, since all the herders reach the same conclusion, overgrazing and degradation of the pasture is the long-term fate. And the overgrazing cost here is an example of an externality and an illustration of another kind of social trap. And so I think, uh, I think, uh, and because, and there's a further thing that's really important to understand about the tragedy of commons example, is that because the sequence of events of each guy acting in his own rational interest in an Adam Smith kind of way, we're trying to maximize my own return, but now I'm, instead of creating an efficient market, I'm ruining the commons, because it's this sequence of events follows predictably from the behavior of the individuals concerned, Hardin describes it as a tragedy in the classic Greek sense of the remorseless working of things. And as such, it illustrates how invisible hand, laissez-faire approaches to resource problems do not always provide the expected optimal solution. In Hardin's hypothetical commons, the actions of self-interested individuals do not promote the public good. It's a market failure, what happens uh, to the commons. So here's another example I'm going to do now with you. So don't participate in this if you've ever, raise your hands if you've ever participated in a dollar auction. Anyone ever? A few people? Okay, so you can opt out. So here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to demonstrate another uh, social trap. I'm going to auction off this dollar to you guys, okay? Now, because I expect to lose this dollar, I'm going to make two rules. Listen to the rules. The first rule is that you must bid in five cent increments, okay? Because do not bid one penny at a time. And you must go in sequence, so don't just leap ahead, okay? So we're going to bid in five cent increments. Do people understand that rule? Yes? The second rule is, because I expect to lose a dollar, I'm going to collect payment from the winning bidder and the second winning bidder. So the highest bidder and the second highest bidder are both going to give me money, but I'm only going to give the dollar to the highest bidder. You understand that rule? Everyone understand the two rules? Okay, here we go. This was invented, by the way, by a professor at Yale, this dollar auction. Okay, here we go. I'm bidding, I'm auctioning the dollar. Who bids me five cents? Raise your hands. Five cents over there. Who bids ten? Ten. Who bids 15? Speak up. Bid so I can hear you. Bid 15. 20. 20. Come on, bid for the damn thing. 25. 30. 30. 
Raise your hands as you bid. 40. Rosario bids 45. 50. Sam bids 50. Who bids 55? Matt, right? Yeah. Matt bids 55. 60. 60. I forgot your name. Sucriti. Okay, so Matt bids uh, 55 and Sucriti bids 60. 60. What, what have, you, have you noticed anything at this point? What have you noticed at this moment in the game? Hello, speak up. Raise your hands. What have you noticed? Have you noticed anything so far? Yeah, I'm already going to win, right? Okay, keep going. I have 60. <laughs> I have 60 from Sucriti. Yeah, who bid 65? Raise your hands. Bid. 65. 65. There we go. 70. 70. 75. 80. 85. 90. 95. Dollar. Someone bids a dollar. <laughs> who bid 95? Raise your hands. There you are. What's your name? Sarija. Sarija. Okay, and what was your name that bid a dollar? Dustin. <laughs> Sarija, are you going to do anything now? Thank you! So Sarija bids a dollar five for the dollar. Dustin, how about you? <laughs> what? A dollar ten! Sarija? <laughs> Good <to> stop! <laughs> Will you guys see me after class, you two? <laughs> okay, so what is the point of that exercise? What did you learn from that? Seriously, pay careful attention to exactly what happened there. Simple rules. You all knew the rules right from the beginning, and yet you fell into the social trap, and I got, I was made a profit very early in the game, and eventually you started bidding more for the dollar than it was worth, right? What happened? Yeah, what's your name? Joanna. Joanna. So everyone had an individual goal to eventually get the dollar, but by everyone pursuing that individual goal, we kind of caught the track of the commons because we made the value of the dollar more than it actually was. Okay, and that's exactly a good description of what happened. And what further properties does this, this illustrate? Unlike the tragedy of the commons example, so maybe I'll just tell you. Martin Schumbach here at Yale invented this game to illustrate a paradox brought about by traditional rational choice theory in which players with perfect information in the game are compelled to make an ultimately irrational decision based on the sequence of rational choices made throughout the game. So at every step, you're doing the rational thing. Every single step, every one of you was acting rationally. But even though you knew the rules and were acting rationally, you get an irrational outcome at the end, right? It's like the, like the lemmings jumping off the cliff. You just, you were like lemmings. You just fell for it and went right off uh, the cliff. So there are many kinds of social traps like this. Market failures, ways in which uh, collective phenomena emerge, bad ones, emerge from people's uh, interactions. And because of such social traps, as well as for other reasons, we humans form institutions. We constitute governments. We have voluntary groups. And these are all examples of how groups might work together to address the underinvestment in public goods, or how they can respond to the probability that people would do foolish things as a group that made sense as individuals. This is one of the reasons we humans band together in particular ways, in order to address the possibility of these kinds of, uh, of failures. And in short, social capital, which is a public good, is valuable. And it is worth the investment. And it yields a very high rate of return in terms of socially valued goods, such as public safety, education, and health. And there are a number of ways you can think about different locations of social capital. So for example, when we want to think about, OK, how can we foster social capital in our society? And at what level are we looking at it? We can think about young people in schools, think about improving civics education and community service programs, where we make people aware of how they're interdependent, teach them how interdependent they are, or provide them opportunities to be of use to each other. In workplaces, we can provide incentives for firms that promote voluntariness and social connection, try to reduce anomie in the workplace. 
With respect to urban design, we can design our cities in ways that foster face-to-face -face communities, that limit sprawl, or that have architectural features that bring you guys into contact with each other. We can foster norms, as I hope to do at Silliman, to get you guys to talk to each other, not treat each other as you know, alien entities within the university. Or we can think about politics and government, and how social capital might imp uh, impact assessment exercises or policies that strengthen caregiving of different kinds. And here's another take on this idea. This is a very, very famous uh, speech that was given by uh, RFK, Robert F. Kennedy, at the University of Kansas in 1968. And I'm going to close by reading you these, these remarks. And if you haven't heard them before, I hope very much that they will make a big impact on your thinking and on your education. Here's Kennedy speaking in 1968, Robert Kennedy. Half a million American children suffer from serious malnutrition, and I have seen some of them. I have seen personally some of them starving in the state of Mississippi, their stomachs bloated, their bones and their bodies scarred, many of them retarded for life. Up to 80% of some Indian tribes are unemployed, and the suicide rate among the high school children is shockingly high, dozens of times the national average. For the black American of the urban ghetto, we really do not know what its unemployment rate is, because from one-fifth to one-third of these adult men in these areas have literally dropped out from sight, uncounted and unknown by all of the agencies of government, drifting about the cities without hope and without family and without a future. By these standards, we are not so rich a country. Truly, we have a gross national product, almost $800 billion. But can that be the criterion by which we judge this country? Is it enough, he asks. For the gross, and here's what he says, for the gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and jails, for the people who break them. It counts Whitman's rifle and Speck's knife and television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. And the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of our education, the joy of their play. It is indifferent to the decency of our factories and the safety of our streets alike. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither wit nor courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our duty to our country. It measures everything, in short, except that which makes life worthwhile, and it can tell us everything about America except why we are proud to be Americans. It's incredible. That's it for today. See you next time.